Hey guys, welcome out to Revolution this morning. <clears throat> We're going to go through one of James White's um, most recent uh, video uh, concerning um, Erasmus. And so actually it's, I think it's, um, he's done one video since then. Um, but if you go to his uh, YouTube, the video which is called Future Predictions, Social Issues, Refuting Bradley Mason, Erasmus, and Stephen Anderson, Chapter 3. Um, roughly about the um, one hour and one minute mark, he starts talking about Erasmus. And he holds up uh, Jan Kranz's book, Beyond What He's Written. <clears throat> now, um, thankfully, Beyond What He's Written has been available uh, for quite a long time uh, on the internet. It's been uh, written, I think, in 2006. And so for many years, it's been available on archive.org. And I remember reading somewhere that Jan Kranz had uh, allowed it to be put there. And, um, you know, I've gone through that book quite a fair bit, you know, and I, these books you don't usually read from cover to cover like a novel. You, you go, as you're studying things, you um, go for a search, you go through and, and you look at relevant passages and certain themes, etc. And so um, when I was uh, basically answering James White's um, questions concerning Revelation 16.5, I used uh, Kranz's book. But um, I mentioned uh, conjectural emendation in my, um, in my study on Revelation 16.5 and basically just pointed out that James White seems to be alone with his understanding of conjectural emendation uh, he doesn't define it like Kranz at all. He doesn't define it like Metzger and Ehrman. But I only just put Metzger and Ehrman there because a lot of people don't know about Kranz. And so um, I didn't go on about it because that wasn't the main reason uh, for writing what I did. And, you know, maybe I should elaborate on that when I write my book uh, on the same topic. But so um, even before... For um, previous dividing lines, you know, obviously James White knows me as Mr. Texas Receptus on Twitter. And so every now and then I'll just show him things that in his book, which I have right here, uh, King James Only Controversy, you know, I'll just go through something and um, like say I went through uh, Easter, you know, and I've done extensive studies into the word Easter and it's not a pagan word at all. It actually comes from Usta, which Luther used, and which is short for Ufustahung, which means resurrection. So the word Easter actually means resurrection. And this is one of the um, ridiculous things that I see um, among text critics is they they just redefine everything. <laughs> something's pagan or something's, um, you know, mon monogenes, however you want to pronounce it. Um, they always, yeah. You know, James White will say that means unique or one of a kind, and but when you apply that, when you go through the Bible and you apply that to a lot of verses, it doesn't make any sense, and that's because um, the Greeks have a different, a completely different word for unique or one of a kind. Uh, I think it's monodikos, and so I'll, I'll just go through James White's book and just randomly pick something like say. You know, when I went through Revelation 16.5, I found that, you know, he had all these pictures and everything. You know, a lot of these pictures, it doesn't even have Revelation 16.5 in it. <laughs> he thought the Latin sanguis there was sanctus, and so he skipped the actual reading. And the fact that, you know, no one's actually picked that up until I did, it just shows you the, scholar, the rate of scholarship of people who follow James White. Um, you know, even just on this page, he's got the 1555's defences, 1550. Now, I understand, look, I wrote um, Revelation 16.5 article for James White. And when he refused to take it from me, I gave it to him in his hand. I said, here you go, Mr. White, you know, after one of his preaching things in Australia. And he refused to take it, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. But, um, you know, that's sort of what you'd expect. And so I just stopped doing the article, I said, look, here's a sort of, here's the answer to what you've been um, talking about. And so um, 
I basically after that I thought, well, what's the point? And so I just made it available online. I told a whole bunch of people that it's got a bunch of typos, a bunch of mis- bunch of mistakes in it. But now I'm writing a book on it, so I'm going back over it, and I'm sort of embarrassed by some of the things that are in there. But it wasn't like an academic treaty treatise or anything like that. It was basically just a rough draft, so James White could get the gist of what I was saying. When you go through this book, it has things like the Granville Sharp rule. You know, the King James translator didn't know the Granville Sharp rule. Well, how come Erasmus in his 1598 um, edition, if you look at his annotations, he um, clearly says that um, uh, he clearly spells out basically the Granville Sharp rule in um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And he also says, look at Titus 2 through 13, because the same applies there so that's the Granville shut rule way before Granville and the, you know, these are the cornerstones of the, the modern day textual criticism this is how this is why I think modern day textual criticism is stupid it's dumb because these are the modern scholars I'm not a scholar um, but I can see such gaping holes in their theories it's a bit like you know Richard Dawkins getting up there and, and sounding all intelligent and just the average Joe can just scratch their head and go, hang on, there's holes in this theory. And that's what we're seeing in the um, modern um, text theory is, is so many holes. Like just, just even not knowing the English language, not knowing the history of the King James translators, not knowing anything about Erasmus. You know, he has the Granville Sharp rule written there <laughs> years before. You know, and how many times has James White said this? How many times has Dan Wallace said this and sounded all scholarly and all the Granville Sharp rule... It's, it just makes these guys look like buffoons, absolute idiots, because um, you don't have to be too intelligent. You don't have to be a savant to figure this sort of stuff out. You just, just do some Google searching. Just look at information contrary to what these guys are saying, and you can easily poke hundreds of holes in what they're saying. You know, I'm, I open a page here, and I just find 20 things that, that are wrong. It's like with James White and his debate with Jack Morton. I counted about 20, I think it was 18, um, errors that he made in his opening statement alone. Just going through, I was just like, no, that's been easily disproven. And see, the thing is, um, these guys just have their narrative and they just run with it and they just keep pushing it. And they're, they're the ones accusing us, Texas Receptus people, King James people, of um, being unwilling to learn. You know, I'm reading Crans. I'm re- I've, I've read all the Bart Ehrman stuff except for the last few years and, you know, God's um, problem. That was just <laughs> just a big whinge about life. But, uh, you know, I went through it once and I was like, there's no real value for someone looking at textual criticism. Um, but, you know, people will put their name on the back of White's book. Oh, this is amazing, you know. And so what I'm going to go through today, I'm going to look at Erasmus and... This myth of back translation and how dumb it is, how absolutely absurd it is. And even Erasmus cleared this all up because this was an accusation from Lee against him. But this has been rehashed um, mostly by Wettstein. And so we're going we're gonna to go through a bunch of that. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to let James White speak for himself. Um, and I'm going to stop at certain um, points and just sort of clear things up because you know, he sort of accuses Erasmus of, you know, the same old thing. You only have one manuscript for Revelation, which <laughs> he's telling us to read the annotations. He hasn't even read the annotations himself of Erasmus. Now, the reason he's telling us to read the annotations is because in my, um, in my defense against um, James White's false claims of Revelation 16.5, I go, go to the annotations of Erasmus and I show that the triadic declaration of who was and is and is to come was uh, part of the um, annotations of Erasmus at Revelation 16.5. And so this would have been known to everyone in uh, that Reformation period. Everyone read Erasmus's annotations. And so uh, he basically said that the thought never came into anyone's mind, but Theodore Beza just you know had this idea and said, that fits, you know. But where I point out, no, this was this was questioned by everyone. Erasmus, uh, Lorenzo Valla, he questioned it. And so, um, okay, let's just go through um, what James White's saying. Now, usually what I do is I turn my laptop around and let everyone see James White's face and all the rest of it. But what I find is it 
flashes on and off and I haven't really got good lighting. And so until I get the technology to put, you know, James White in a little box down here, I'm just going to um, play the YouTube clip and you'll hear his voice and I think that should be enough. So you're just going to have to look at me, sorry. <laughs> but I'll let James White talk and I'll just stop at relevant points. So I'll get the volume up a little bit. Um, here we go. Um, I tweeted the cover of this book and I put it on Facebook too. I described it as a one volume destruction of textual traditionalism, ecclesiastical textism, and everything else. Why? This is Ian Kranz's 2004, I think, uh, dissertation on the... Oh, I forgot to grab it. Grab I don't think I have it in here. Nope. I don't know. I was going to grab it. Um, I'll try to grab it next time. Uh, Erasmus's... Both Erasmus and Beza. You have... When we talk about the Textus Receptus as a group of texts, um, we primarily look at its origins in the five editions of Erasmus in the work of Stephanus. So Erasmus is between 1516 and 1535. Stephanus is in the early 1550s. And then Beza starts doing work in the 1560s, but up through the 15, late 1590s, uh, his 1598 edition, the final edition being the one that has the biggest impact on the King James translator. Anyway, um, so this is a doctoral dissertation looking at the, uh, it's called Beyond What Is Written, uh, Erasmus and Beza as conjectural critics of the New Testament. And so to look at how they handled the manuscript evidence that was available to them and produced the printed editions that they did. Both of them produced extensive writings. Erasmus produced his annotations. And what's fascinating... I want to um, stop on is he's James White just saying in these annotations um, every now and then he just say this is what it should be but he didn't print it and it's like uh, maybe James White is alluding to the Revelation 16 5 article um, where he's uh, Erasmus says it should be uh, who was and is and is to come uh, Revelation 16 5 instead of who was and is and shall be which is the King James reading and Erasmus's reading from um, 1882 onwards. Um, but I guess, you know, Erasmus, you know, he puts that in his annotations and clearly the annotations were there to uh, clear up things that were ambiguous, to um, look at al the alternative readings and things like that. That's why he had annotations or else he just would have left it as the text. Um, but he's, you know, James White's just sort of made this sweeping accusation that, well, Erasmus didn't really care what was in his text. Um, you know, sometimes in the annotations he says, well, it should be this, and they leave it. Um, well, usually it comes down to uh, proof. Uh, the burden of proof was upon Erasmus to do certain things, and as we're going to look at the burden of proof uh, for the Book of Life, we're not going to go too much into Revelation chapter 22, verse 19 today, but that would be a good future um, uh, video to do, but you can clearly see that um, Homo Teuton was uh, was at play there, and Erasmus admitted that, and so um, there there had to be a good reason to include it in the text, and so this is uh, you know, obviously anyone writing a biblical commentary uh, where they are compiling a text from manuscripts, usually they they write notes. They say, well, we're we're torn between this reading and that reading and all the rest of it. But to say that Erasmus didn't care about the text, that's just ridiculous. It's just a smear. And he's not offering uh, any citations there. He's just saying, yeah, Erasmus didn't care. And this is one of the things that you'll see with people who come from the school of um, Bruce Metzger, 
um, like say people like Bart Ehrman and Dan Wallace and James White and you know usually the people who aren't the upper echelon of um, textual critics these guys are sort of you know just popular guys they know enough to sort of get get them out of a uh, an argument on textual criticism what you find is these guys just they make things up they they will do what Metzger did and just surmise and say well I think this happened I think the scribe was thinking this and this is where Bart Ehrman gets all his stuff from because he starts going well I, I just think the, the scribes were having a bad day and he, perhaps he spilled coffee all over himself and you know then he wrote you know Jesus got angry or what you know all this sort of stuff or he deleted Jesus got angry um, but yeah so anyway I'll let James continue he fully expected that anyone he cared about was not just going to look at his Greek New Testament, but was going to read his notes, which is, became a large amount of material in and of itself, and then make their own decisions. He's literally saying, could be this, could be this, here's the arguments, leave it up to you. So he did not have a focus on what was actually in the readings. He, he did in the second edition. The second edition varies the most from the others, where he tried to make some changes. But then I think he just sort of gave up on that and turned his attention primarily to the annotations. And so there are a number of places where his judgment as to what the original reading is is not what's actually printed, even though that's what's picked up by Stephanus and Bayes at a later point. What is fascinating is when you read this book, you realize these men were doing textual criticism. So many of these textual traditionals. I just, you know, this textual work. Well, and I'm going to try, I'm still going to try to get to Anderson today. Uh, we, we're against textual uh, criticism because this, that, the other thing. You can't be a te against textual criticism. Your Greek text required textual critical work to exist. Erasmus did it. Beza did it. The question is, how much information did they have? What were their methodologies in comparison to what we have today? We are in a better position than they were. In a much better position than they were. They did tech... Okay, I just want to <laughs> clear up a few things. Um, you know, the textual traditionalists that he's talking about. Okay, well, um, basically, people today, like myself, you know, I'm, I, I run the website texasreceptus.com, um, I believe exactly what um, uh, Edward Hills believed, that the underlying Greek text of, of the King James Version is that unique Texas Receptus edition that w it was unprinted, um, but you know, Scrivener tried to uh, uh, redo that text, and he did pretty well, but there was a few issues here and there. But basically, the underlying Greek text of the King James Version is the text Receptus. And that's the go-to text that I believe is akin to the originals. And so I think that that uh, work, the editorial work done, started by the Complutensian Polyglot guys, or actually started by Lorenzo Valla, really, um, Complutensian poly Polyglot guys, then five editions of Erasmus and the uh, four editions of Stephanus, and then the 11 editions of Beza then all compiled and looked at and examined by the King James Version translators. I mean, the 1598 of Beza is very, very close to the King James, but there's just a few tiny little, you know, splitting hair moments um, in the King James, which is why people say well, it's unique from the 1598. And so, um, yeah, basically, when you look at the textual criticism of these guys, it was completely the opposite, almost, of what they do today. Okay, so to, what they do today is they favour Vaticanus above everything, where most people, like, say, even James, I don't even think James White knows this, you know, he, he sort of just, he just parrots what he's heard on the critical text side, and, and a lot of the time he has no idea what, what um, text receptors people believe or, or King James Version um, supporters uh, will say because he's so against that that he just, he's already got his guard up. He's not going to learn anything. And so Erasmus clearly said that he believed that Vaticanus was a recent publication and he dated it to the 13th century. Uh, he believed it was a back translation of the Latin. <laughs> and that's what's so amazing, listening to James White claim that here is Erasmus. 
back translating from the Latin. You know, we're going to look at that later. But the whole reason he rejected Vaticanus, if you read his letters, if you read the letters of Erasmus, it was because he believed it was um, designed from the Latin. It was, it was um, to cause the Greeks to have a text that was closer to the Latin Vulgate that had be, become corrupted. And so Erasmus, he clearly saw that and he said, I, I think this is, this is no good. I'm not going to use it. When you look at John Mill, a lot of critical text guys love John Mill. You know, he's a legend. You know, 1707, he passed away and he also finished his work that year. But um, <clears throat> John Mill clearly, um, he clearly said uh, Vaticanus was corrupt. He, he di didn't use... Oh, he, he, he didn't like the, um, the readings of Vaticanus. He said it shouldn't be used. And so all the way through the Reformation from Erasmus, all the way through to, to um, you know, post-Reformation, John Mill, um, they're rejecting Vaticanus. But now, all of a sudden, Vaticanus is the best manuscript to go to. And it's pretty much the one that Westcott and Hort used. Yes, they had Sinaiticus there, but... Most of the time, they went with Vaticanus. I always remind myself of to be or not to be. See, B is the designation number for Vaticanus. And a lot of the time, these guys were just going with, um, with B. And so basically, it's just been resurrected. B has been resurrected as the go-to text. And, um, and that's it. And so it's the opposite of what Erasmus is doing. Erasmus, that what... Erasmus, Stephanus, Beza, and the King James translators eventually um, put the capstone on it. What these guys were doing was looking at all the received texts. So the received text of the Latin, um, the Latin branch, the received te of text of the Greek, the Byzantine text, the received text of the Syriac, the received text of the Arabic. So you've got um, Tremelius and Genius. These guys looked at these. These were um, contemporary with... Um, uh, with Theodore Beza, and they all worked on a Latin uh, translation together. Uh, and when you look at these texts, there, there were certain streams that became very popular. And so um, they were looking at the, the received text of each one. And so when you've got all these received texts together, you can clearly see which one, um, you, you know, which readings have, um, you know, certain attestation. You can look at the, the writings of the early church uh, they call them early church fathers. I just call them the early church writers because, you know, uh, the issue of calling no man your father and all that sort of stuff. But the patristic writings, so they call them. You, uh, well, Erasmus was so saturated with the patri patristic writings that he would read a text and know if it had been influenced by certain people. Uh, he said at one stage, I saw the influence of Marcion in this certain text. And, you know, there were certain doctrines that were being pushed. And so he would read through texts and see either in Latin or in Greek that they had been tampered with in certain ways. And so um, the, the textual criticism is very different. And so I'll read to you what I've got on my website. So my website, if you just go to tr.org.au, you can clearly see, um, you know, the web page is 10 years old. Some of the articles I've done 10 years ago. So I've, sometimes, you know, I update my views, I change my views according to new information. But one of the things that I've written here is... Um, Modern textual criticism is focused on a narrowing of the field to a few corrupted and rejected manuscripts, sidestepping the huge amount of Greek and Latin manuscripts and the early church witnesses as unimportant, only to be used when they can be referenced to try to give some sort of support to Vaticanus prim primacy corruption. Um, it really is an anachronism fallacy or a false definition to speak of Erasmus, Stephanus and Beza doing textual criticism since their value were in general opposite to those of Greece back uh, to Hort, to Metzger, to Wallace confusions. They based themselves on mostly the Greek and Latin manuscripts and the early church witnesses with some faith consistent logical and grammatical type internal evidence considerations. This is essentially the opposite of textual criticism as used today 
which has a bias presupposition towards Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. So hopefully you understood that, where basically what I'm saying is the guys in the Reformation, they, um, they considered a lot of evidence, but they rejected certain evidences. They rejected Vaticanus. They looked at Codex uh, Beza, but they rejected uh, Codex Beza. Um, they saw it as corrupt. They, they, when King James was given, well, he actually died before he was given it, but when um, England was given uh, Codex uh, Alex, Alexandrinus, uh, they didn't just straight away just amend their Bible to suit. They looked at it and went, well, in the Gospels, yeah, it's got these type of readings, but you know, other places it, there is corruption. So they knew corrupt texts when they saw it because they were looking at the bulk of other manuscripts that have been used by the churches. So, you know, you've got the Syriac text, you've got the, like I said, the Arabic text, you've got the, the Latin text, the old Latin text, the, the older Vulgate text, commentaries, you've got early church writers, you've got all these other witnesses against the critical text. And so um, I think what James White's saying here is ridiculous. You know, it's basically saying, oh, these text critical guys, they... Um, Sorry, these Texas Receptus guys, they are doing the same thing as, you know, um, what we're doing today. We're trying to piece the, the Bible back together. It's textual criticism. That's a bit like saying, well, the, the founding fathers of America who are you know, piecing together the United States Constitution, they're, they're doing the same as what they, Mao was doing in China or what Hitler was doing in, in Germany. We're just trying to create a new government. You know, why don't you like politics? They practice politics. Why don't you get into politics? Why do you reject politics? Yeah, that's, that's how dumb what he's saying is because he's just saying it's exactly the same textual criticism. Um, clearly, it's not. It's, it's Like I said, it's the reverse. Vaticanus was totally rejected. And so um, where modern textual criticism, Vaticanus is elevated to um, idolatry status. And when you have all these new... Uh, type of, you know, the, the rejected text, obviously even um, Sinaiticus, I mean, that wasn't being used in the monastery. <laughs> no one recognised it as this brilliant text, you know. <laughs> it's just sitting there, uh, you know, and there's a, a case for it being a forgery. If you go to Sinaiticus.net, there's quite an interesting website talking about um, forgery, but it's interesting that... Um, Erasmus believed that in um, 1439, that was uh, roughly when Vaticanus was written. It's quite an interesting thing to look at as well. Um, the, the Reformation people, um, people who defended the text Receptus, Dean John William Burgon, uh, Scrivener, Miller, you know, they, they looked at Sinaiticus and they rejected it for other reasons. Now, I understand people nowadays might even reject it because of the Simonides story or whatever. Either way, it's been rejected by, by Texas Receptus people. And so um, to say that we're sort of doing the same thing you know, back then as today, it's like, no, 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 you're looking at rejected text. Texts that you know, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, trying to amalgamate them together is, it's like chalk and cheese. These, are, these, these texts disagree more than they agree. And um, you just have to read Hoskier's work on that and you can see how many times, you know, um, it's you know, counted up to, you know, 3,000 times, but many, many times over that there, there are differences, you know, 5,000 times. And Because we're looking at um, just the Gospels alone, you know, over 3,000 times. And so the texts are different. And so you don't find, you know, uh, if I was to do just a Bible translation just based on a Byzantine text, I'd probably get sort of roughly, you know, a, a, you know MEV style thing with, you know, it, it would be, have majority text readings and things like that. But it's like, it wouldn't be exact, but it would be very close. If you were to get Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and do translations of both, sit them down in English and look, read them together, you'd be like, hang on, this is so different. And that's the problem is their manuscripts are not cohesive. They don't even agree with each other. The best manuscripts that they got don't even agree with each other. And so what we have in the Byzantine text, what we have in the Old or Latin, in many of the Vulgate uh, texts is we have a, a cohesiveness. And so uh, textual scholars like Erasmus, you know, fluent in Latin, fluent in Greek, these guys could easily see 
in these traditions where things were lacking, where there were issues, textual issues, etc. And so um, today, people just basically have a Vatic Vaticanist primacy. They put that one first, and then they base everything off that. Um, all the critical text editions up to the 28th um, edition and UBS 5 uh, are based upon Westcott and Hort. And so that used to be a huge argument. It's not based on Westcott and Hort. Well, David Cloud, you know, he contacted Metzger and said, well, how did you do your text criticism? And he said, well, firstly, we got the text of Westcott and Hort and then we amended it. It's like, you know, these guys at James White and Wallace, they will just blow their trumpet until someone proves them so wrong that they have to put that trumpet away, but then they'll just get another trumpet out and start blowing that. And uh, I, uh, as I said, I just go through this book and like I've done in the last few weeks, looked at Easter, looked at the Granville Sharp rule, you know, I just go through Revelation 16.5. I, I just see so many holes in this book. And um, I guess eventually I'll probably write a, a full rebuttal against this book. It'll take a bit of time, but um, but I think what James White's done is he's just put all the bad arguments <laughs> into one book. And sure, there's a few things that I would go, oh, yeah, that's just normal you know, things to say about the Bible. I mean, you know, you can't say everything wrong. And also, you know, he talks about things about the King James Version. I believe the King James Version is perfect without translational error. I'll debate anyone in the world on this. I'll talk publicly, whether it's on Skype, whether it's on um, you know, face to face or whatever, I'll debate anyone on this issue. Um, I'll debate anyone on Revelation 16.5 that the correct reading is Somenos. I'll debate anyone on the issue of Easter. Um, you know, James White, I've, I've asked him to, de to debate and you know, he doesn't think that I'm prominent enough or whatever, you know, so he's, he's aiming for you know, Robert True Love and these other guys, and when they're like, "Look, we don't really want you to come to our conference," you know, you're a bit of a heretic, and well, they didn't say that. They're like, no, "Brother, you know, just calm down." And he straight away like, "Ah, oh, these guys don't want to debate. I'll debate him any day of the week." Yeah, what he says in this book is just ridiculous. It's so easily disproven. And um, the whole issue of Revelation sixteen five. If you haven't read my article, clearly, I offer um, pretty much everything that James White didn't say in his book. He actually says that he checked the Ethiopic, it wasn't there. Well, it is there. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I won't diverge because I'm actually in the middle of writing the Revelation 16.5 book and re-going over it again and, and adding a few little bits here and there. And so that's why I'll keep going back to that. But I've got to stick to James White. Let's go. Textual criticism. We do textual criticism. We can look at what they did there is one example in the annotations, it didn't impact the reading in the text, but from Erasmus's perspective, where Erasmus's dislike of the doctrine of predestination is clearly seen in the choices for his final reading. What do you get to do with that, brother Calvinist? The point is, they did textual criticism. And so often I hear both King James only advocates and TR advocates and ecclesiastical text advocates making the same kinds of arguments about this naturalistic textual criticism, blah, 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 blah. How many of you have read any of the annotations? The annotations... See, so straight away, like, see, later on in this clip, he talks about me. And so, he, obviously, he's having a dig at anyone who's TR, but specifically at me, and also, you know, probably Robert Trulove and, and, um, and Jeff Riddle. He's like, how many of you have ever read the annotation? Um, well, I just offered you um, a whole article which has a whole section on the annotations of Erasmus, explaining what the uh, annotations are there for, explaining how we should look to them to basically understand what um, what Erasmus is saying. And so he's just, you know, how many of you have done it? Well, I think stacks. Um, when you listen to Jeff Riddle, you know, uh, he's going through uh, some of the annotations of, of, of Theodore Beza, seeing whether they've been translated accurately from the Latin or not. Um, we're doing this. You know, how, how, many, how many critical text guys have ever read um, Theodore Beza's uh, 1598 annotations? James. Um, how many 
how many of you critical text guys have seen that the Granville Sharp rules there? Jane, you know, it's just like he just lumps everyone in the same bag. I don't know uh, Robert True Love personally or Jeff Riddle. I've listened to lots of Jeff Riddle's um, you know, sermons on sermon audio, only really when he's talking about textual criticism, his other stuff, because I'm not a Calvinist. And so, um, you know, I'll listen sometimes, but a lot of the time it doesn't really apply to where I'm at. And so I go, okay, well, that's fine. But when he's talking about, you know, Dan Wallace or, you know, um, uh, James White and other things and preservation of the text and Westminster Confession, I, I listen to all that and I, I agree with Jeff Ridley. He's a very intelligent guy. He's a smart guy. Um, anyway, I'll keep, I'll let James continue talking. ...are normally only available in Latin. Hey, at least if you read this book, you're going to get to read what Erasmus said. And you, if you're honest, you would be sitting there going, Erasmus sounds just like Brutes Metzger. <laughs> Erasmus sounds just like Bruce Metzger. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, anyway, I'll... I think you you know what I'll what I want to say there, but um, Jeff Riddle did a really interesting um, uh, word magazine. It's an audio, and he's also he writes it out. If you type in stylos, um, which is Greek for pillar, uh, stylos Jeff Riddle, and you type that into Google, you can find his web page, and you can go through and listen to his audios. A lot of the time, his audios are on sermon audio as well. So type in Jeff Riddle, and it's usually his Word magazine uh, editions that, that talk about, you know, text criticism and all that. So he did one on the life of Bruce Manning Metzger, and I've listened to that quite a few times because it's it's like he's written a whole chapter of a book there, and it's quite interesting. You know, listen to that, and then listen to the life of Erasmus or something, and you'll just see these guys are just chalk and cheese, you know. <laughs> um, you know, but anyway... That's, that's James White's uh, point of view. I totally disagree with it. Um, okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. He does. Except, I think Metzger had a higher view of the text of Revelation than Erasmus did. That is so ridiculous. I mean, Bruce Metzger, have you ever read the Reader's Digest Bible? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, have you ever read um, you know, the, the commentaries that he had on the text? Have you ever seen how Bart Ehrman just so naturally um, fit like hand in glove with Bruce Metzger? And, and the only sort of error that Bart Ehrman seems to have done is gone, I don't believe anymore. He's saying all the same things. Even James White, when he was going to debate Bart Ehrman said, look, I pretty much um, dealt with all these things in my King James Only book, um, but I still believe. And that's because, you know, um, you know, Bruce Metzger, he recommends this book. and um, So it's all this, pretty much all the same stuff. And sometimes it's word for word. James White will just be just saying exactly what, what um, Bart Ehrman says because it's Metzger. These guys are disciples of Metzger. And, you know, that's, you know, James White's doing his PhD, he's obviously going to be learning a lot more about Metzger because um, I think it was his second last student or something like that is in South Africa and he's going to be learning from him and doing his PhD. And so there is a type of you know, modern day textual criticism that, uh, you know, when you go through the Metzger stuff, it's just like, man, how, how do you come to that conclusion? And a lot of the time it's not referenced, it's just... Um, intellectual chick tracks <laughs> yeah they're referencing of themselves and um, they don't really go outside of their family to to look at other things and um, you know, you won't find James White usually going back to the source he'll go to Kranz and say well he's already gone back to the source so I trust him or he'll go back to Metzger I, I trust him he rarely will he ever go like right back to the actual annotations go through the Latin and try to work it out, which in Revelation 16.5, it's exactly what I did. And so I read through, um, well, thankfully, Revelation 16.5, the annotations there were in English, and it pointed back, like it was clearly pointing back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. So I read that, I, have, I tried the best that I could to translate that into Latin, 
and I came to the conclusion that um, that Theodore Beezer thought it was nomina sacra, and that he um, uh, he felt that it was a the a nominative um, uh, word phrase, uh, noun phrase, sorry, and so he believed that it was a, a full name, and that it, it was. Uh, that holy was written on it because of nomina sacra. That was his, what he said in Revelation 1, 4 and Revelation 16, 5. He talks clearly about that. And because of the name Jehovah, the name Jehovah or Lord or Curios was very close nearby. And so um, the expansion of the name Jehovah coming from the Hebrew word Hava, um, it clearly expands you know, the I am, you know, who was and is and shall be. I found that out through reading the annotations. I found out Erasmus had it in his annotation. And so, um, yeah, why is he saying, do you guys ever go to the annotations? It's like, well, clearly we do. Why are you saying this? It's almost like what we do. He's saying, do you guys ever do that? It's like me, you know, saying, hey, guys, I just read the Bible from cover to cover. And then James White getting on there and saying, do you guys even read the Bible? It's like, um, yeah, <laughs> we, we just dead we just celebrated that i've read it cover to cover you know that's the type of ridiculous type of slander that this guy um deals in but anyway i'll let him continue let me um let me just read a couple things here and then we're going to go to anderson um this is uh chapter four page 67 uh at the top, there's a quote from Jerry Bentley. It says, Erasmus clearly anticipated modern scholars by developing and employing the method of inference. So in other words, he was doing type of criticism, just like we do. Just like we do. Except he rejected Vaticanus outright. <laughs> he didn't want anything to do with it. And he looked at the readings. He looked at the you know, above 360 readings. And he was like, okay, well, um, but... He, you know, when he was living in Italy, obviously he would have had access to a lot of those, um, a lot of those texts. You know, being the most prominent, you know, humanist scholar of that age, uh, he would have been able to walk into the Vatican Library. Yeah, you know, he he would have known people there. That yeah, you know, it's not like he was what he was doing at this time was wrong. Um, you'll find that there is a misconception about the Roman Catholic Church that um, yeah, you know, they were just totally against any type of Bible translation or whatever. I mean. When you look at the Ethiopic, the 1549, that was done in Rome. It was funded by Rome. Um, when you look at the Syriac, done in Rome, funded by Rome. So they were clearly involved in, in uh, translation. Uh, when you look at the Complutensia Polyglot, I mean, and so, you know, Erasmus could have walked in and out of these places and looked at texts. And so, um, anyway, we've got to stick to the point or else this will drag on. If you object to it being done today, then you should object to him doing it. And you should reject his text. But you won't, because you can't. Because you have to have textual criticism. It did, the, the text... You have to have politics. You have to agree with the Communist Party of China, because they have politics. Yeah, you Americans, you have to agree with their politics, because you want politics, don't you? That's just how dumb it is. The textual criticism of then is so much different to what it is today. It's just chalk and cheese. Text does not simply float down out of the air. Who believes that? I mean, even Peter Ruckman didn't say that. He said it's translated from the text receptus. I mean, I'm no fan of Ruckman. I believe he's off the wall. But he was basically saying that the King James doesn't agree with any Greek text, which is pretty much very accurate. A lot, Even a lot of text, uh, TR people don't realise that. Um because the, the King James is its own unique form of the text receptus, and that's what um, Edward Hills was saying. And so that's why we go with what Edward Hills said, you know, it's the underlying Greek text that they didn't print. Had they printed it, there'd be no King James movement or whatever, but it's just a made-up thing. Anyone with a little bit of logic and a little bit of common sense can say, yes, they didn't. There's 20 differences between Theodore Beza's 1598 and the King James English text. It's like, well... 20 difference it's hardly anything and you know i mean you could probably just get Beezer's text and pen those things in it probably take two minutes um that's the difference really it's it's almost nothing but um you know 
someone like Peter Ruckman, you know, they, they usually say, yeah, he believes it's sort of like a secondary inspiration. Talking with Ruckmanites, usually they're swearing at me and saying I'm a psycho, saying all sorts of things, you know, because they don't really like me. But um, they actually say, you know, Peter Ruckman said the King James Version is a translation of the text receptus, but they made their own um, decisions up. And when he's saying that the uh, English corrects the Greek, he's talking about the modern Greek. And so this whole thing of oh, floated down on a cloud, it's just a smear. It's just a straw man argument. I don't know anyone who believes that. Everyone that I know who is basically, well, except for the odd weirdo here and there, I do get some guys jump on my thing. Where there's one guy who even thinks the Hebrew was English and the Greek was English. It's like, man, what have you been smoking? But um, this whole concept of floating down from heaven, it's just a smear. I mean, I don't, I don't believe that. Robert Trulove doesn't believe that. Jeff Riddle doesn't believe that. No one in the um, the forums that James White reads, even you know, Stephen Anderson doesn't believe that. Who's he actually talking to? If I said, you know, you believe that the text just floated down into Westcott and Hort's hands, that's what you believe. You'd just say, well, no. And why is James White constantly saying, oh, we can't misrepresent the Catholics or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the, or the Muslims? You know, we've got to understand what they believe because we want to win them to our position. So we've got to understand what they're saying. But then he totally misrepresents, you know, King James onlyism, Texas Receptus onlyism. He misrepresents everyone. And so, um, anyway. The work's got to be done. Erasmus did not make a thorough recension or revision of the Greek text. He merely provided one. I've told you before. That was not his focus initially. It became more of his focus later on. But it was not his focus. And it Why is he emphasizing on this? It's a bit like me saying, okay, well, James White wrote this book, okay, first. Later on, he wrote The Potter's Freedom. See, The Potter's Freedom wasn't his main focus, so you, that book is pretty much stupid. This is his main focus. You know, it's like, well, why is he saying, you know, Erasmus focused on the Latin, and that was his main focus. So the Greek, he's just like, oh, I don't really care about the Greek, and it's just haphazard, and, you know, I don't really give a stuff about it. <laughs> That's not the case at all. But this is the type of language that these snakes use to try to get into your mind that Erasmus just had a, a carefree attitude about the Greek text. Uh, he only cared about the Latin. He just sort of did the Greek as a bit of a side project, like he was playing golf or something, and then, you know, just printed it and, you know, just happened to be, you know, very popular. And now we've got this horrible text receptor that we have to get rid of, and we've still got this problem in the church and blah, blah, blah. It's just ridiculous. I mean... It's just a focusing on something. I mean, can't, um, couldn't Erasmus multitask? Couldn't he look at the Greek and look at the Latin and look at many other things? I mean, you know, he only has to have one focus, you know. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. Initial. Although he chose to print the Greek text as he found it, with some emendations mainly from other manuscripts than the ones he used as printer's copy, he regularly raised questions about the quality of its text. Erasmus regularly raised questions about the quality of the Greek text that he himself produced. Now, this is one of the things where we're looking at what Jan Kranz has said, okay? Now, I'm going through Jan's, Jan Kranz's writing. I believe he is uh, he's way more intelligent than uh, James White. But sometimes that can be even more dangerous because it, the argumentation can be you know, quite scholarly and you've got to dig further to get to truth. Now, this whole concept of the back translating, we're going to look at. Um, uh, I'm going to show that Kranz is wrong and White is wrong, ridiculously wrong. Um, but you know, here we have James White just reading you know, someone else's book as if you know, that's gospel. Well... What James White really needs to do is he needs to um, to show where in his annotations that he said these things. Now, 
Um, I know that Cranes, you know, he offers lots of footnotes in his book, and I've gone through lots of these footnotes myself. Some of them are still in Latin, they're untranslated. Some of them are translated. And I believe that um, Jan Cranes has actually translated some of the annotations in a biased way. Because when I listen to what James White is saying, and I'm reading the book on my computer here, um, if you actually want to read Jan Cranes' book, just type into Google, Beyond What Is Written, Type in crayons, that's with a K, and um, and it should come up in archive.org. So you might even want to type in archive as well, and it should come up. So you can download it as a PDF. It's free. It's just on, on the internet, um, and I'm pretty sure crayons has said that um, that's fine to do that. Um, yeah, Henry Peters has just said, I think James White is... The only one that never questions what he himself writes or says. That's that's exactly right. I mean, you know, I wrote a you know, 80 to 90 page um, dissertation about Revelation 16.5 and exactly what James White says in his book. Instead of just going, wow, Nick, that's really quite interesting what you've said. I might actually look at that or retract something. You know, he's just basically said, this guy's desperate. This guy's, you know, he's lonely. He's just... You know, he's probably a librarian just there. He's he's like a Mormon, he said the other day. And I'm like, hang on, even my um, unsaved relatives, they they have watched it just out of curiosity because it's all over my Facebook. And they're like, man, this guy's really writing you off. He doesn't even know you. And even old friends are contacting me going, yeah, you're a Mormon, Nick. <laughs> it's just like, it's ri so ridiculous, you know, and he has no idea about me. Or, and he hadn't even read my book. You know, he ref publicly said he refuses to read it. But then the other day he admitted that he, he had read it. So anyway. Um, so, yeah, we're going to look through uh, how Jan Cranes actually um, turns this... Uh, turns this against Erasmus, basically saying that Erasmus didn't care about um, what was written or didn't care who the author of Revelation was. And so we're going to look at that a little bit. Anyway, I'll let James continue. Sometimes these questions became conjectures on the text. Their place, as we will see, is mostly in the annotations, not in the printed text. Why not in the printed text? It was not Erasmus's goal to produce a text that could bear the weight that is placed upon it by modern textual traditionalists. You are misusing Erasmus. You're abusing Erasmus. And once again, just like King James only advocates have to ignore the preface from the translators to the reader because it's so painfully obvious to King James translators did not hold the principles of King James onlyism, textual traditionalists have to ignore Erasmus and others in their perspectives as well because they're they were not trying to do what has they're not trying to produce what their texts have been turned into by textual traditionalists. That's because we believe that the Complutensian guys, well, Valor, Complutensian, Stephanus, Beza, and finally the King James translators, they nailed it. They worked out everything in the text and we we've sort of nailed it and that is because the era of printing started and they were compiling manuscripts getting things together and they were looking at things and going okay well, we want a perfect perfectly printed text and so that found its way um, into the underlying text of the King James Bible and thankfully it's in English we can still speak that language today you know if it was in German I would have I would go with that German Bible that's as accurate. Um, but it just so happens to be in English. Now, English has become the dominant world language. We can speak that. You can understand what I'm saying in English. Most people can just grab the King James, open it up and read it, you know, and, and Jesus, when he was baptised, went up straight away out of the water. I can understand that. You know, most people can just get a dictionary. Or if you can't understand it, I've worked on the King James Version 2016 edition, which if you type in kjv.org.au, you can see an update of the archaic language, uh, grammar and syntax of the King James, and uh, you can look at something that's as readable as the New King James, but without you know, 500 errors in the New Testament that um, they introduced. Um, and so... Yeah, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, James White's obviously reading Dan Cranz's stuff, and so um, 
there's lots in there that I could deal with, but I, I won't deal with that at, right at the moment because I really want to get to this whole, you know, the last six verses of Revelation thing. And so I'll just let James continue. Now, one of the things that I found fascinating, I found some answers. I've had this book for a while, but I've used it, you know, like most books use it for referencing. You look up particular citations, references, stuff like that. But I took it with me so that I could get through it. Um, because when you fly, you frequently have time for things like that. So um, one of the questions that had always dogged me was in light of Erasmus's having translated the last section of Revelation from Latin back into Greek, because of the defective nature of the manuscript of the commentary that he had on Revelation. So in other words, he had pitiful material with which to work. Are you listening to this? He had pitiful material of which to work. You know, it's like we just have this embarrassment of riches now, and we, we're checking all these other readings, and we have so much more to work with today. And you know, Erasmus just had pitiful, you know, he had nothing. It's just amazing because we're going to go through this and we're going to see that what Erasmus really says about um, what he had. Well, okay. We know that's true. It's true. Th this book verifies that. But, I mean, Jan Kranz is the... You go to his level and that's it. You know, you don't you don't think about these things. You don't look up things yourself. You don't... Uh, you, you just trust what the scholars have said. Smarter guys than James White have figured this out. And so you go to them. You go to the Metzgers, you go to the Kranz, you go to you know, Bart Ehrman a little bit. You know, but, um, usually what he says is right, but his conclusions are wrong. Um, you know, go to the Aylands and these other guys, you know. Um, we know that's what happened. But why... What would that keep him from not fixing it later on once the pressure was off, once the first edition was out, right? <laughs> um, uh, this is, this uh, actually amazed me when he said this. And so uh, I'm, I'm just going to try to find a, a Twitter, um, a tweet that I sent to James Wyatt. Um, I've got, I've been tagged in a whole bunch of other stuff, which is a little bit annoying because, um, uh, I had, I was easily able to find a lot of um, James White's um, tweets and things, and but now I've just got a whole bunch of stuff that this doesn't relate to sort of anything. So I'll just uh, go to James White's tweet, and so basically what he's saying is, in the first edition of Erasmus, um, yeah, Erasmus, yeah, the most brilliant Renaissance scholar of that era. You know, Renaissance men, you know, they knew a lot of stuff. Many of these guys, because printing had only just started, they'd actually read every book that had ever been printed. You know, they were brilliant guys. Um, brilliant linguists. Um, they knew Greek. They knew Latin. They knew the context of these words. They knew the context of the words in pagan literature. They knew the context of these words in the early church writings. Brilliant guys, you know, um, you know, up there with you know some of the greatest ever. Yeah, you know, if these guys were scientists, you're looking at Einstein. You're looking, at, yeah, and Einstein. And you know, it's a bit like a, a flat earther sort of saying, you know, Einstein didn't know anything. You know, I can understand that people can disagree with things, but you've got you've got to sort of be on a certain level to come against these guys. And so, um, okay, where are we? James White tweet. Um, okay. Now, actually, this might take a long time. I've got a bit of a slow internet. Da -da -da -da. Here we go. Oh, yeah. It's interesting to see what James White uh, talks about. Um... I don't think I'm going to get to that tweet. It's just too far down. Perhaps 9th of March. So I'll search for it. Oops. No. Basically, what James White is saying is that Erasmus 
slipped on a banana peel here. Totally goofed up. Had no idea what he was doing. And people who came after him, even he himself, and he was attacked for writing this in his first edition. And so he was involved in this whole um, conversation with a guy called Lee, writing letters to him. And so he talks about these last uh, six verses of Revelation. And then when you go through, you know, his four other editions, then when you go through Wolf, um, uh, Stephanus, um, Colonnaeus, uh, people, all, pretty much all the Reformation characters like, um, you know, Tyndale, Luther, um, all the, you know, the Roman Catholic after the Council of Trent, you know, the, these guys, the Counter-Reformation, um, Theodore Beza, King James translators, all the Roman Catholics and all the Protestants for 300 years didn't realise how badly Erasmus stuffed up. So usually when you've got that sort of claim, it's huge. Oh, this is so huge, you know, to, to think that those people were so dumb and so illiterate that they didn't look at the annotations. I mean... Um, yeah, Isaac Newton, he, he read the annotations of Erasmus and wrote lots of notes on it. Um, many people did, you know. It, it, Calvin, you know, John Calvin, he he loved the works of Erasmus. He, he he didn't like to give Erasmus too much praise, but he his whole ministry and everything was changed by the scholarship of Erasmus. And so for James White just to say, look, for 300 years, none of these guys figured it out. And Erasmus himself totally slipped on a banana peel here and, um, you yeah, know, he didn't know what he was doing. Um, well, I'll just let James continue. But to me, it's a bit like when I was doing my Easter articles and I was showing that no one in the Reformation ever thought that Easter was a pagan thing. No one. So we're talking about, you know, Tyndale, Luther, you know, even guys like Erasmus. He lived in England for five years, by the way taught there um then you've got you know the geneva bible guys coverdale you know bishop's bible king james translator all the way up until alexander hislop basically started to say oh you know this is the pagan goddess ishtar or it sort of started from the grim brothers and a misreading of, of dictionaries but um yeah i was sort of like hang on how come none of these linguists in the reformation ever went hang on this word's pagan, but it happens, you know, mid, you know, I think it was 1853, so the mid-19th century, these guys have sort of gone, the lights are gone, and it's like, hang on, this is pagan, and then we've, got to, we've got to stop this. And, you know, the first to sort of get right into this are like the you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, and, well, they came a little bit later. It was Seven Day Venice, Jehovah's Witnesses, and they start promoting this, and then now it's just mainstream. It's a pagan thing, you know. Um how come no one in the Reformation discovered that? And it's almost laughable to think that someone like Tyndale would translate, you know, say, or 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 7, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, sorry, where it says, you know, Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. Tyndale has Christ, our Easter lamb, is sacrificed for us. It would be like saying Christ, our fertility goddess lamb, is, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. It's so dumb when you read it, read through it. It's like, the, you know, the, the concepts that James White says, you know, Easter is a pagan festival and all that, it's so dumb. Um, you know, getting that word Easter and just putting it into that context. And so it's it's just as dumb what James is doing here. He's saying that for 300 years, no one had a clue what they were doing. Erasmus didn't have a clue what he was doing either. So let's look at what else he's going to say. I mean, why didn't he just over the, I mean, that's 1516. He's got 19 years before the last edition is going to come out. Plenty of time to find some good manuscripts of Revelation in there somewhere, right? So why didn't he fix it? The answers have come forth. Um, all right. Here's... Um, all right, the sources themselves indeed show that the most important aspect is the editorial responsibility felt by Erasmus, but in the case of the final verses, Revelation 22, 16 to 21, 
there is more, as becomes clear from what he writes in his answer to Lee's criticisms. And Lee was one of his biggest opponents. And is one of the ones behind the eventual ins insertion of the Kamehameha. There was no doubt that some things were missing. This is what Erasmus writes. And it was not much. Therefore, we completed the Greek from our Latin texts so that there might be no gap. We did not want to hide this from the reader, however, and acknowledged in the annotations what we had done, in order that if our words differed in some respect from those that the author of this work had provided, the reader who obtained a manuscript could restore them. Notice, hey, we'll leave it up to the reader to restore them. I'm not trying to provide some inspired text that will be the basis of all future... <sighs> Like as if Erasmus was there, like I'm providing the inspired text sort of thing. He was doing work on the Bible. He he loved the Word of God, and um, just as you know, I've worked on Bible translation. It's not like I just sat there and went, you know, hey, I'm inventing the Word of God or something like that. No, he was he was careful to go with what historically was shown to be the received text, and so. Um, yeah, as as he goes on to this quote, I'm going to um, read it from someone else uh, other than Kranz, uh, translated by Erica Rummel. And so this was the go-to uh, book um, that if you want to go through uh, some of the annotations, uh, you can go through them. And so we'll let Kranz speak, and then I'll, I'll show you how she translated it. And it's not like what James White has said. Now, J Admittedly, James White is just saying what Cran said. So obviously, uh, there is a difference here. And this is the problem. We're relying on scholarship to do this translation stuff for us. And, um, you know, many times, I mean, you look at the whole, um, the whole industry of, around Nostradamus. Nostradamus, it's been proven that not one of his prophecies have ever come true but it's the way that it's interpreted from Latin and translated into English. So there would be a certain river nearby um, uh, Nostradamus's uh, house or where he was staying. So he would write about that, and that would look like Napoleon. So they would say, oh, he's talking about Napoleon. But it's not. It's just the name of a local river. And so people are reading into things that, that aren't there, and that's what I find with the annotations um, of Erasmus, people are just reading things into it, and we're going to look at a little bit about that in a second. And even this that we did here, we would not have dared to do so. Now listen to this. We would not have dared to do in the case of the Gospels, nor indeed in the Apostolic Epistles. The okay, so what Erica's translation is... I'll, I'll just go through it line by line so it's a little bit easier for you to get it. Um, he says, And yet I would not have dared to do this in the Gospels or even in the Apostolic Epistles, what I have done here. Style of this book, Revelation, is very simple. Okay, so here it says the language of this book is very simple. Okay. And its contents are mostly narrative. So uh, it says here, And the content has mostly a historical sense. Let alone the fact that its author has long since been unknown. It says not to mention that the authorship was once uncertain. Okay. Um, the authorship was once uncertain. Okay, so I'm going to read the whole quote in a second. I'm just reading what James White says, and I'm comparing it with this this, but even I'm going to read the fuller quote, and you're going to see it's totally out of context with James White saying it. Um, finally, this place is only the ending of the book. Okay, it says finally, this passage is merely the conclusion of the work. Okay, so I'll let James White talk for a little bit because he goes on and you know how little respect Erasmus had for the book of Revelation and all that. And I'm going to show you. If you just read the context of the annotation, it would clear everything up. But James has a barrow to push. Uh, he has, you know, and like I said, he's being, um, he's reading something by Jan Kranz. Now, Jan Kranz, uh, he's a Dutch guy. Um, how good he is at English, I don't know whether he's brought these words across properly. But um, I'm looking at um, 
the annotations of, of um, the translation by Erica Rummel. Um, and this is on the page of confessionalbibliology.com. So if you go to Google and type in confessional bibliology, just one word, and then typed in Erasmus, Revelation, Vulgate, this page will probably come up. Um, so we'll let James talk and, and show what he thinks this is saying, and then I'll read the whole context about how it just doesn't mean anything about what James is saying. <laughs> so, uh, Kranz writes, From these remarks, several elements deserve attention. The editorial responsibility to leave no gap in the Greek text, the reader's responsibility or latitude to amend Erasmus's text when this is possible on the basis of other Greek manuscripts. Erasmus has no problem with that. And above all, Erasmus's lack of interest in the book of Revelation. He, he doesn't care. I, w I wouldn't have done that in the Gospels. I wouldn't have done that in the Epistles. But it's Revelation. It's a simple book. You know, it's, it's we don't know who wrote it. He clearly has a minimally deuterocanonical view of the book of Revelation itself. It's a, a deuterocanonical view. So that's eventually what... Um you know, Deuto canonical is you know say at the Council of Trent they elevated the the apocryphal books to Deuto canonical. Um, so yeah, it's it's like an apocryphal book. Um, so it's like that was a revelation, you know. Erasmus was clearly aware of the provisional nature of his Greek text and 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 listen to this. Here's here's the answer to the question I've had all along. He is clearly aware of the provisional nature of his Greek text and even ordered the proofreaders of his second edition, that's 1519, to supply the final words of Revelation from the Aldine edition of the Greek Bible, which had just appeared on the market. Since he believed that this was done, he regarded the matter as closed. So he never checked it again. Here's the problem. There's a footnote. Footnote 16. Erasmus writes, Thus, when I sent the revised copy to Basil, I wrote to my friends they should restore this place from the Aldine edition, for this work had not yet been purchased by me. It has been done as I had asked. So Erasmus said it has been done as I had asked. And James White's like, really? No, we believe in conspiracy here. It didn't ever get done. And I'm going to show you how how stupid all, all this whole concept is in a minute. But I'll just let James just continue. He just, I'm just giving him a lot of rope because it's going to hang him. So Erasmus sends second edition in, says, um, that last part of Revelation, copy it in from Aldine. Actually, it was the first edition um, that that happened, but we'll go through that in a minute. And he thought it was done. So he never returns to it. Here's the problem. You ready for this? I think this is fascinating. I think this is great. It seems Erasmus never realized that the text of the New Testament in the Aldine edition is derived from his own first edition. He may have been misled by the few instances in which its editor, Asulinus, followed Venetian manuscripts and which made the Aldine text diverge from the Erasmian. But in Revelation, they had just used Erasmus' first edition. So there was nothing to change. So this is how dumb James White thinks Erasmus is. So James, um, Erasmus is like, okay, I'm working on my edition. Now, he thinks it's the second edition, but these annotations are in the first edition. And so... Basically, when you, you know, read through uh, the uh, 1516, you can see it's in the first edition, where he said the last, um, uh, the last verses that are in the um, Reuchlin's um, manuscript, uh, the, the last page has fallen off. And so what he does is he says to the guys at Aldean, um, hey, guys, look, uh, the last page has fallen off here. Now, you guys have a bunch of Greek, uh, Greek manuscripts of Revelation, which we have been working on, which we mention all the way through the book of Revelation, that there are many copies of Revelation, not just one, not just the Reuchlin one. And so um, it doesn't have the last verses there. 
I'm away from Basel at the moment, and so can you guys fill that in from the text uh, of the Aldine? So the Aldine texts have been going on for many years. They've been working on the Old Testament, which is pretty much akin to the Complutensian Old Testament, um, but it, it is different because the Complutensian Old Testament wasn't completed until 1522, uh, sorry, 1517, and so it's not identical. There is differences there but it was uh, published in 1522. And so, um, but I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. I'll let James continue and then I'll read exactly what I've got here. Or else I'm going to confuse you, I think. There was nothing to change. He didn't know. And he never went back. So he never went back and changed it. So basically what James is saying, he filled in these last verses from Latin and he, no one ever corrected it. No one ever went back and fixed it. But you know, Erasmus clearly said it has been done as I had asked. So, in when people were criticizing him about this, he said, "Well, it got done." And so, but James White just read that, but didn't see that. He's he's seeing what he wants to see in Erasmus's words, and so is Krantz. So, his low esteem for Revelation is not. Now it's just. Low esteem for revelation. Now, I'm going to go through who invented this low esteem concept. Um, it goes back to Bengal. Not only clear from the statement just cited, but also from the paucity of his annotations on it, as well as from the remarks he made concerning its barbarous style. He even concluded, quote, There are differences even among jewels, and some gold is more, more pure and tested than others. Also, in sacred matters, one thing is more sacred than another. End quote. Erasmus had a very low view of the book of Revelation. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to read a few quotes. Well, actually, I'll read the Confessional Bibliology page. Um, where are we? Uh, okay, I'll read the whole quote. This is Erasmus. There was no doubt that the words had been omitted and there were only a few. So he's talking about in, in the last, um, last few verses of Revelation. To avoid leaving a lacuna in my text, I supplied the Greek out of our Latin version. I did not want to conceal this from the reader, however, and admitted in the annotations what I had done. My thought was that the reader, if he had access to a manuscript, could correct it, um, could, sorry, could correct anything in our words that differed from those put by the author of this work. And so I'm actually going to read, I thought the, the whole quote was there, but it's somewhere else. Um, Okay, Erasmus's exact words. No, I'm not going to do that. Sorry for jumping around a little bit here. I'll let James finish, and then I'll read through this whole thing, because I've sort of written an article about it, and I don't want to just find the middle of the article and sort of spoil it all. So I'll let James finish. We'll know exactly what he's got to say about it, and then I'll offer my, uh, my understanding. That's why he just didn't care. Didn't care. With Delich's finding in mind... Rudolf Pfeiffer writes that, quote, three centuries were to elapse before it was discovered that there was no authority for the Greek wording of Revelation 22, 16 through 21, the TR, except Erasmus's knowledge of the Greek language. Wow. Wow. Now we know why. Now we know why 300 years pass. Fools. Where somebody goes, hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> there, are no, there are no manuscripts to read like that. What happened? And somebody goes back, reads the annotations in Latin. Oh, oh, huh, hmm, okay. Which also makes you go, well, what about Stephanus and Beza? How come they've got the same problems? Just mm. dimwits, I guess. Oh, oh, my friends. God. That's just the beginning. There's so just this, much more Just in the here. beginning. So many texts to look at oh. and to examine in regards to what 
um, Erasmus and Beza did, and the final readings found in the Texas Receptus. As I said, I cannot conceive. I, I know I, there's, a, there's a guy on, on Twitter, That's Texas me. Receptus. Facts are irrelevant to me. He, he is no different in thinking than any Mormon I've ever met who cannot for the life of them examine any factual refutation of any error in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is just right. This is the way it is. That's it. And archaeology doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Detect doesn't matter. Citations of the King James doesn't matter. The Book of Mormon is true. You can do the same thing with TR. And that, that guy on Twitter, that's what he is. Just, just whatever. I don't, doesn't matter what the facts are. I'm just... There's always a way to do it, as long as you're willing to be um, uh, circular in your, in your reasoning. So, with that, believe it or not, <clears throat> real quick, well, not real quick, some responses to Stephen Anderson, chapter 3, He's done all 10 chapters. We've got to get to him eventually. One of the reasons I'm doing this is because, sadly, you're going to hear Stephen Anderson saying many things that are frighteningly parallel to the textual traditionalists. Stephen Anderson. Frighteningly parallel. I've, been, I've seen stuff posted in the past five days on Facebook by Reformed men that epistemologically is no different than what Stephen Anderson is saying in a number of these criticisms. And that's frightening. It just, it's just, it's just frightening. So, dive in. Stephen Anderson's response to chapter 3 of the King. Okay, so that's what James White says. Now, let me show you the good oil. Okay, so I'm not sure um, where we're at. I think we're, um, I haven't got a time thing on my, on my video there. But, so from this point on, I'm just going to be reading through um, this article. So, I'll actually turn that computer off. Okay, so let's look at point number one. So the main issue uh, of James White here is to focus upon Erasmus and to discredit um, the TR position from Erasmus. So what he does is he also, he not only belittles Erasmus, but he belittles Stephanus and says, you know, these guys didn't really do any textual criticism when clearly they did and clearly everyone of that era thought that they did and I'm not talking about modern textual criticism I'm talking about you know Stephanus had his manuscripts he listed what he used uh, as Beza did in his annotations the King James translators they'd read all this they understood all this um, you know for to say that they didn't look at Erasmus they didn't read his annotations they didn't figure it out is it's it's a huge accusation it's an absolutely huge accusation and so um yeah basically the um white's just saying they just followed erasmus they followed not only just followed erasmus they followed erasmus's blunders and errors um now we understand that erasmus he's his text is the main foundation for the tr now i won't deny that uh, there are some people who say that Stephanus's work was sort of like a, um, you know, an, its own independent work that just so happened to come up with very similar readings to Erasmus. I believe that um, Stephanus, he used as a base the text of, uh, the latter text of uh, Erasmus. He also used a Complutensian polyglot. He used all of those resources. Um, I don't think that he just totally neglected um, Erasmus, but that is... Uh, some people are saying that but um the back translation concept often parroted by modern text critics um is amazingly the exact thing that erasmus was working on his latin for so he was he already created a latin text okay um then he's working on a greek text uh for him to be you know, creating a text that's just back translated from the Latin is, is sort of against everything that he was for. And so morally, he was known for rejecting texts like Codex Vaticanus, saying oh, it's just back translated from the Latin. I don't want that text. I don't want to look at it. Um, and so it's sort of like his own argument is turned on its head. It's a bit like um, 
you know, trying to just say there was some anti-abortion people in the United States. And years later, after they're dead, it's like, well, um, they were for abortion. You know, it's just the exact opposite to what he was doing. And so um, that in itself should make you question whether Erasmus did this or not. But we're going to see, I'm going to clear this up for you in your mind. So you, you will no longer look at this text and just go, ah, oh, it's back translated. Oh, what I'll do is I'll show you clearly um, what Erasmus did from his own quotes and from other people and from letters from Lee. So we know that white is susceptible for falling um, for lies about Erasmus, so, such as the rush to print concept, you know, the, the anecdote about rushing to print or the comma wager. You know, he even mentioned that there, you know, that's the reason he put it in was because of Lee, because he provided this Codex Montfortianus and said, there you go, there's the comma, and he had to put it in because of this rash wager. And, you know, even Bruce Metzger in his uh, fourth edition, he said, I think it was his third and fourth edition, uh, he said that that was uh, wrong and um, uh, de Jong had uh, clearly debunked this. So these type of banana peel slips of Erasmus cause modern critical text proponents to swallow other lies, such as the back translation here that James White mentioned. So once you've sort of devalued Erasmus's scholarship, it's a bit like sort of, um, you know, labelling someone a Ruckmanite. Then you're sort of like, well, what else are they wrong on? You know, sort of thing. And and so, um, you know, this, this is how these guys work. They they debase the work of Erasmus, and then it's like they debase um, his scholarship, and then it's sort of like, well, this guy was just a dimwit on this area. Surely he's a dimwit everywhere else. And then they're just looking for holes, and that's what the critical text guys do with Erasmus. They just look for things that he said, and they try to put them into a certain context, which he never said it. And so I'm going to read that longer context a little bit later, and you're going to see exactly what he meant. Um the comma wager is the belief that Erasmus made a promise to insert the comma of any Greek manuscript um, uh, that was found containing it. And a text with a back translated comma from the Latin in the form of Codex Montfortianus was written on demand for him. So it's sort of like, you know, he made this promise, someone just did a back translation, did a whole manuscript. And even if you look on Wikipedia, it says the date of this manuscript is 1520 which is to fit in with this story. <laughs> it's because, oh, this story is true, so that must be when it was written. And so Erasmus was like, oh, now I have to do it, you know. Um, this concept also fails um, to acknowledge that the Complutensian com compilers used many Greek manuscripts, and they put the comma in 1 John 5, 7, that was printed two years before Erasmus had printed his edition. So this is one of the problems the Complutensian guys had completed their New Testament. Um, uh, Cisneros, who funded the Complutensian polyglot, tried to recruit Erasmus to work on the project twice. Uh, in November uh, 1516, uh, the abbot of Husilios wrote to Cisneros praising Erasmus's Novum Instrumentum Omne, his first edition of the New Testament which had just been printed by Froben Press. Um, the abbot praised Erasmus as a good theologian, knowledgeable in Greek and Hebrew, it's interesting, and an elegant Latin stylist. He suggested to Cisneros that he employ Erasmus to work on the Complutensian Polyglot project. And these are his own words. Given that he has anticipated your reverence with his publication, I believe that he could be of assistance in making your work appear somewhat more polished. So basically saying, this guy is so good, we want, we want to hire this guy because he's actually done such a good job. He will make our work look, look really good. Um, he wrote, I believe that your reverence uh, should not deprive yourself of a person like Erasmus. You should avail yourself of his assistance in the correction of the whole publication and hire his services for a certain period. So they're saying, man, Erasmus has done such a good job, we should really hire this guy, um, you know, headhunt him. Uh, Erasmus declined the invitation um, and he was again approached in May 1517. Erasmus briefly states the reason for a second refusal. The Cardinal of Toledo has invited me again, but I don't like Spain. 
he was just like, I don't really like Spain. I think that uh, Erasmus saw a radical element in Spain that he probably didn't like. Um, you know, the, the Spanish Inquisition probably wouldn't have been as favourable to him as um, where he was uh, when the whole thing with Martin Luther uh, came down and, and, you know, they're saying that he laid the egg and Luther hatched it and all this sort of stuff. It could have got him in a lot of trouble around Spain. And so that's my own personal um, annotation. In 1527, um, Joan... Vergara refers to the matter in a letter to Erasmus calling that Cardinal Cisneros, the founder of Complutense University, had the most wonderful esteem for you and was keen on enjoying your company. So that's the type of scholarship um, levels that um, he was at. You know, the, the, some of the greatest scholars of Europe are like Erasmus. You are brilliant in Latin, in Greek and in Hebrew. Amazing. We're shocked at how good you are. We want to hire you. Um, you know, just think about the words that um, James White said about Erasmus. Um, but we'll, we'll look at this. And so, so when we look at the whole concept of 1 John 5, 7, I mean, um, if Erasmus was just going to back translate to, uh, from the Latin, um, yeah, he could have just done that in 1 John 5, 7, and avoided this whole thing, just said, oh, look, I just back translated it and then just overlooked it or whatever. But this is sort of like a different accusation that White's making and Kranz is that it's just the banana peel situation where he forgot to do it. He just, you know, he said he would in his annotations and then later on he said they did it, but he didn't. <laughs> it's a pretty amazing accusation, actually. Um, so looking at the annotations, White asked in his video, do you even look at the annotations of Erasmus? And then he addressed me, so obviously he's got me in mind when he's saying this. Um, I do look at the annotations, so I have the PDFs. Um, if you go to my website, tr.org.au, click on the Texas Receptus, little hyperlink there. It's all over the front page, just where the words Texas Receptus appear. It's a hyperlink. And you'll see that I've got links to every PDF of Erasmus. I've looked at them all. I've gone. I've actually looked through all the annotations of Erasmus um, dealing with the issue of Revelation 65, for example. Um, I've looked at everything um, Beza had to say about it. I've even looked at the handwritten um, annotation of Beza on Revelation 65. I don't think James White's looked at that. He has no interest in looking at that now because he's been proven wrong. He's just like, no, I'm right, I'm right, and he's throwing sand in the air. But why is he accusing us of this? Why is he saying, you know, do you even look at the annotations of Erasmus? Okay, so we'll, we'll look at these annotations and we'll see what he's got to say. Um, so that was one of my main focuses in the Revelation 16 fire book was the annotations. Okay, so... Um, but the thing is, James White saying, do you even read the annotations? Does James White look at what Lee said in his letters. Um, so, let's firstly look at the critics, okay? So there's a guy called Bengel. Um, now, you've got to be careful with Bengel. He predicted that Jesus would, would return on the 18th of June, 1836. Um, he propagated the false notion that Erasmus failed in these last verses of Revelation. So most of this information just goes back to Bengal. Um, so Erasmus had already stated in his annotations that he had several manuscripts of Revelation. So if you go through his annotations in Revelation, he'll say, well, in our several copies, it says this and that. And so he, he obviously has more than the Reuchlin manuscript. So this is one of the main things they're saying. You only have one manuscript it goes against everything else Erasmus has said. So you know, you've got to take everything into context. James White is not taking anything in context here, neither is Cranes. They're just simply believing the scholarship that's gone before them, and there it's just scholasticism all over again. Erasmus, uh, sorry, Bengal falsely claimed that Erasmus had only one manuscript of Revelation. Bengal failed to understand the context of Erasmus's annotations and letter to Lee. 
So Lee was basically a critic of Erasmus and would point out anything that, Erasmus, that looked like Erasmus had failed and Erasmus was constantly saying, Lee, this is why I've done it. And he wrote letters and sometimes he'd write things in his annotations further on to clear things up. Um, yeah, a bit like Sam Ballard or someone. Erasmus made it abundantly clear that he was away from Basel. He was away from Basel for the purpose of consulting the Reuchlin's manuscript. Okay. So the Reuchlin's manuscript is the only manuscript James White will say that, that he had uh, and Kranz. But he was away from Basel. So he's doing all his work and everything. And he's his, his, his Reuchlin manuscript. He's going to check it out. So he's away from home. He's away from all these other manuscripts, okay? Um, he's consulting the Reuchlin manuscript. Then Erasmus, uh, sorry, thus Erasmus had other manuscripts available to him, uh, but he was going off and looking at others. Okay, so it's very clear from his annotations. He has... Um, he has other manuscripts and, but he's looking at other, he's looking at the Reuchlin saying, okay, well, this is really good. The entire context of this is missed. This gave birth to the false notion that the Reuchlin manuscript is the only manuscript that is used for revelation in his first edition and has simply been parroted uh, through to today by enemies of the text of receptors like James White, Jan Kranz. Um, so this poor scholarship is the basis for the last uh, six verses of Revelation being missing concepts. So this is where it sort of starts with this, oh, he only used the Reuchlin manuscript, you know. Had they read through all of the annotations of Erasmus, they would have seen he used words like other manuscripts, our manuscript, the 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 manuscripts, plural, even in the words that they use um, ab about this whole topic, uses the plural when it's talking about manuscripts in the Greek. Um, uh, then people were wondering why Reuchlin's text differed for, at times from Erasmus. So he's, Bengals made up this idea, you know, he only had one manuscript. And so they're like, okay, well, if I only had one manuscript, let's look at this. Um, why is Reuchlin's text at times different from Erasmus's 1516 edition? And so they falsely concluded that he back translated all those other places from the Latin. So this is in the earliest stages. Um, this started as speculation that Erasmus used a Complutensian polyglot or marginal notes from Reuchlin's or practiced conjectural imitation, just made them up, you know, just that, that fits, that looks good. Um, you know, sound familiar? This is sort of what James White says about Beza, but he didn't even read the, the footnote of Beza. He quoted it, but he didn't understand it. He didn't read it. He didn't go to Revelation 1.4, um, but that's a whole other story. Much of these assumptions were cleared up when the Reuchlin Codex was rediscovered by Delitz, now it's a German name, I probably said it wrong there, uh, in the middle of the 19th century. But like the theory of evolution based upon thoroughly discredited evidence, some uh, phantom theories have stuck and become mainline anti-Texas Receptus argumentation today. So when they found the Reuchlin's papyrus, um, the, or the manuscript, they, I shouldn't say papyrus, when they found the Reuchlin Codex, Delitz um, looked at it and he went, wow, this is exactly as Erasmus says, it's missing the last page. And so um, when the Reuchlin's Codex was rediscovered by Delitz in the mid-19th century, the commentary was ascribed in that codex to um, Hippolytus of AD 200. So that's why Erasmus thought it was really good. Um, he valued it very highly, um, as it could be presumed to reflect the exegesis of the pre-Nicene sub-apostolic fathers of the school of St. John himself, the author of the book of Revelation. Um, Hippolytus being the disciple of um, Irenaeus, Irenaeus of Polycarp and Polycarp of, of John, um, Though the commentary was reworked by Andreas and Aretheus, 
Arathias, sorry, probably said that wrong too. In much latter times, there seems a good reason to doubt its being indeed in the most basic and original form, the work of Hippolytus. Okay, so um, basically what I'm saying there is Erasmus, he valued this manuscript as um, a commentary, the commentary going back to Hippolytus, which was only uh, in the year 200, which sort of has this apostolic lineage going back to um, John uh, through Polycarp, um, etc. Semler um, basically copied the whole concept of um, of Bengal and then Griesbach, he followed suit. Um, Griesbach is the father of modern text criticism who propagated many theories against the text receptors. So then Wettstein, at the beginning of the 18th century and Michaelis, Michaelis, probably saying all these names wrong, sorry about that. By the time these falsehoods reached Tregellis, the fable was accepted as history. Um, the pattern was to diminish the number of manuscripts Erasmus used by quoting out of context and misreading what Erasmus clearly stated. Um, statements of Erasmus, hang on one second, statements of Erasmus like the one found in the introductory Apologia to his fifth edition, that just as Valor used seven bona fide Greek codexes or book four manuscripts, um, he used four such codexes, codices, sorry, for his first edition and more for his later editions were seized upon, misconstrued uh, to convey the impression that these were the sum total of the Greek manuscripts that he had available. So what they're doing is they're going through Erasmus's work and they're cherry picking quotes when he talks about how many manus manuscripts he was using for certain places. So Erasmus states more than once that he had several copies or exemplars of even the scarcest text of the apocalypse. Erasmus clearly said that he used the unpublished Aldean edition in Venice. Okay, so the Aldean was printed in, um, in 1518. This is only about a year and a bit after Erasmus had done his 1516 edition. And so um, they were working on things as well. And so he knew that they had manuscripts, of the Book of Revelation. So when he was going through Reuchlin's, he realizes the last um, verses aren't there. So he's saying to them, use your manuscripts to fill in what's there. So it's, it's pretty clear. It's not, it's not uh, he hasn't printed his edition yet, and the Altine guys haven't printed their edition yet. Okay. So doesn't that clear everything up? It's, it's, it's a chronological mistake. Uh, James White is... is um, doing what's called an anachronism, which is something you, you you can't do. It's like saying you know Donald Trump won the 2012 election. You know it's just it's dumb. It's just stupid. But he's just following Krantz, and so we'll we'll continue to go through this, and it'll clear up these misconceptions. So it was the unpublished Aldine edition in Venice, which was based on manuscripts differing in parts from those drawn on by Erasmus for his first edition. So in parts, you know, in certain little bits. In that instance, a reading was obtained on Erasmus's instructions by his co-editors in Basel, either in person or by correspondence from the Aldus, Aldus printers. And what you've got to understand too is these are Erasmus's good friends. Erasmus was a prolific writer. He's writing lots and lots of, um, you know, proverbs in Latin and all sorts of things and biblical things. He's already done a, a Latin Bible and the Aldine printers had a lot to do with Erasmus. These are, they're good friends. He, even um, uh, Erasmus attributes learning the original languages to learning them from Al Aldus. So it's like, these guys are cl close, you know. Uh, I think Aldous died in 1515, probably just before um, the printing of, of Erasmus's Novum Instrumentum on there. The exemplars mentioned by Erasmus 
were most probably there for either his own copies of the oldest and most correct manuscripts or those of his co-editors. An example of the former is Erasmus's revised copy um, of the text of the Apocalypse obtained from the Reichland Codex, which he sent to Basil to, um, to his co-editors along with the instructions to pro procure from the Aldean edition the one reading he was missing. And so um, it is clear that they were working on the text for many years, the Aldean guys. Um, uh, the great scholar Masurus made mention that the Aldean project in 1515 um, was in progress in a letter to Jean Agrolia. So it's not like, yeah, they, Erasmus just printed a Greek text in 1516 and it's on the market everywhere and then they're like, we'll just print that. And so, no, they were working on this edition. And so it's like Erasmus was working with them in this edition as well. So doesn't that change everything? Doesn't that change the way that we're looking at this? Because it doesn't it change everything to know that he had more than the Reuchlin's manuscript. He had other manuscripts. So we're going to look at um, some of the direct words of Erasmus very soon. But we're going to look at Tregegels. A classic example of Trege Tregellus, sorry, Tregella, Tregegels. It sounds like a some sort of food. A classic example of Tregellus's destructive criticism is his treatment of Erasmus's statement about the missing phrases at the end of Reuchlin's Codex. Erasmus's own words are as follows. So this is his annotations in the 1516 edition, so his first ever edition. Although at the end of this book, I found a few words in our texts which were missing in the Greek exemplars. Those in the end we supplied on the basis of Latin texts. Erasmus Erasmus's Latin reads, and I won't read the Latin of just what he just said. So this absurdly was taken by Wettstein at the beginning of the 18th century and subsequently by Tregellus to mean the missing words at the end of Erasmus's Greek text of the Book of Revelation were back translated by the Latin Vulgate by Erasmus because supposedly he had no other copy of the Greek text of Revelation in the Codex he borrowed from Reuchlin. This is the reverse of what Erasmus is saying. So I just want to clear up a few things. I think earlier when I, when Jan Kranz was quoted, quoting a 1519 quote, I actually said it was a 1516. I think maybe I was wrong there. So I've got to really um, look at that a little bit more. But this is definitely a 1516 quote. So he's talking about um, uh, that... I found a few words in our text. I'll, I'll repeat exactly what he said. This is Erasmus, 1516. Although at the end of this book, I found a few words in our texts. So notice he's saying texts, plural, Greek texts, which were missing in the Greek exemplars. Those in the end we supplied on the basis of the Latin text. Okay. So... He refers right from the start to the Greek exemplars, plural, which he had access to. And this proves he had more than Reuchlin's Codex. One of the many confirmations Erasmus consulted in a number of Greek manuscripts of the book, book of Revelation before publishing his first edition is provided on that same page of his annotations, where he observes... In the Greek book form manuscripts, which I have seen, the title was not um, John the Evangelist, but of John the Theologos. Now, these Greek copies, he went on to say, did not have a few words in them at the end of the book of Revelation, which were found in our, plural, texts, plural, meaning that the Latin language texts in common use, oh, sorry, he's saying our texts, our Latin texts. I sort of added the plural thing there by mistake. Um, meaning that the Latin language texts in common use in ecclesiastical circles in the West, and more specifically in Erasmus's editorial circle, however, we, that is Erasmus himself and his 
editorial companions supplied those same missing Greek words on the basis of the Latin. So you've got to understand this is a completely different um, phrase than what he's saying later on in his 1519, which we'll look at. Um, and I'm going to explain the context of what he's saying here. In a sense, A, Erasmus um, could be understood to have back translated from Latin to Greek. Um, Lee accused him of doing so. So this is what he was accused of doing. Um, Erasmus's repulsion at the monkish back translating from Latin to Greek explains the outrage uh, he directed at Lee by saying impudent mouth. So he said, you, you've got a, a foul mouth to say this, to, to accuse me of this. So in response to his unwarranted accusation. And so Erasmus said, not content with that, he, talking about Lee, accused me of an impious crime that in the end of the book of Revelation, I added a small number of words in a Greek codex from our Latin copies. So he's saying he's accused me of, of a crime here. Erasmus promised to reply to the accusation in his response to Lee's note. Um, and that is where we find Erasmus's own explanation of the phrase ex Latinus in his annotations. So Erasmus and his co-editors filled the missing Greek at Revelation 22.19 one verse, with the Latin awaiting the procurement of a Greek copy containing the missing verse. He said he included this fact in his notes, annotations, um, so that the reader could know what had been done. And it is to be understood, and this it is to be understood, is what we find printed in the annotations, the 1516. So basically he said... Um, this one verse, we've had to work back, and he explains it here. He talks about homo eteuton in one verse, okay? So this is in his first edition. Um, in his Apologia, addressed to Lee, printed at Antwerp in 1520, this editorial process is explained in greater detail. Erasmus instructed his co-editors to obtain the missing Greek reading from the Venetian press run by the family and friends of Aldus, which had access to a range of Greek manuscripts not immediately available to him. In the meantime, he wrote down in the copy um, forwarded to his co-editors the Latin passage which the Greek was in, intended to replace. They did as they were instructed. So he clearly says that he did, as, and that's what uh, Cran said. They did, he did, they did as Erasmus instructed. Venice being in Italy, it can be included in the range of possibilities. So this is another possibility that when he's saying he supplied it from the Latin, perhaps he was saying from the Italian sources, which is in Venice, which is where the Aldine Press was. Um, but I don't tend to groove with that. I might have to look into that a little bit myself. If Erasmus's original note to his co-editors read something like supply the Greek from the Aldine printers, ex Latinus, it may have been unclear to the editors themselves and to the printer of the remark of the annotations in the 1516 edition as published precisely which meaning was intended by Erasmus, whether working back from the Latin which I have temporarily filled the lacuna and providing the Greek equivalent or from the Latin's from the Italians. So that's you know two options. I don't think it means from the Italians, but I've got to really look at that. And so that's where it will be great for someone who knows Latin to look at these a little bit close closer um, and to go through these and to you know someone like Jeff Riddle uh, and some of his friends to go through these and to um, to see how correct uh, these translations are. Either way, the missing Greek was supplied from the Venetian printers. So, yeah, Erasmus said they did it, they supplied it, okay. They did it as Erasmus had instructed. In reply to a flurry of accusations by Lee that Erasmus was guilty further of accommodating um, Greek to the Latin, contrary to his own principles, Erasmus pointed out 
that the um, procedure resorted to here, filling a perceived gap in the Greek text, was necessary because of the unique tradition of the often disputed apocalypse, as it was not in the in the better attested gospels and epistles. Additionally, the apocalypse by its simple style and orderly narration made this omission the final flourish at its end and therefore um, easily lost in transmission, um, which was obvious. Erasmus stated in this connection that he and his co-editors, so this is a quote of Erasmus, we're not about to venture to do in the Gospels or in the Apostolic Epistles what we did here. Um, it had likewise been... Th this quote is, has been misinterpreted by those ignorant of the text-critical motive as an admission of guilt that, um, you know, his editorial procedure was, was, you know, he just put the Latin in there. So we're going to see very soon um, the conclusion of the matter. So I just want to talk about Wettstein first. Wettstein went one step further than Bengal in his criticism of Erasmus. In addition to copying Bengal's mistake from Erasmus's access to the single manuscript of Reuchlin, Wettstein misinterpreted the two detailed passages of Erasmus in the latter responses to Lee concerning the last verses of the book of Revelation which were referred to briefly in the preceding paragraph. Um, in the first passage, Erasmus noted that a single verse or a few words, as he put it, were missing in Greek. And that was the verse of Revelation chapter 22, verse 19. Here, Erasmus referring to the Greek copies, plural, he had access to, including but not limited to the Reuchlin manuscript, um, since Revelation 22.19 in the original condemns anyone who takes away from the words of this book, one might think suspicion would fall initially on Latin scribes for having deliberately omitted the verse in their Greek text in order to cast doubt on the orthodoxy of the Greek copies. However, Erasmus thought scribal error was to blame through homoeoteuton, that is, that a scribe um, saw this book, so the words this book in Revelation 22, 19, at the end of the line in verse 18 and wrongly skipped over the intervening phrases um, to recommence his copying in the next occurrence of this book in verse 19. Um, as he said, this was a common source of scribal omission uh, in the medieval manuscripts. So it's just part of parablepsis. Parablepsis is when you just you skip something. At, you know, it's at the end of the line. You, you might skip a whole line. You go through and you're continuing copying, but you've missed what was said. Um, and so this is Erasmus's conclusion. Um, Erasmus went on to say that in the process of editing his text of the Greek Testament, he supplied the missing words from our Latin copies, meaning the Latin text available to Erasmus and his co-editors, which contain the verse, and marked what he had done in the accompanying annotations, leaving a gap in the Greek, which could be filled when a Greek copy with the missing verse was found. As we shall see in the uh, second quotation very soon, uh, the missing Greek text was inserted by Erasmus's fellow editors before the text was published. Wettstein ridiculously misinterpreted this uh, quite correct editorial procedure as an admission that Erasmus had back-translated from the Latin um, in his published Greek Testament. So basically, Erasmus is um, working on Greek manuscripts and he says, you know, can you put these... Uh, these words, can you go through the manuscripts that we've already got because the readings are correct there. And so he sent that to um, to his guys saying, look at the Aldine uh, edition. And so they've looked at that and they've compared that. So let's look at Erasmus's exact words. He says, because the book of Revelation 
never particularly suited the Greeks. So he thinks the Greeks didn't really like the book of Revelation. Um, and that would uh, clearly show to us why there's only four um, manuscripts of Revelation before the 10th century. Um, you know, most of the, what we know about the book of Revelation is in, in, from Latin. Now, there are Greek manuscripts out there and, and um, you know, Erasmus had access to, you know, quite a lot of Greek manuscripts on this. But, um, you know, he was prone to look at the Latin and look at commentaries and things like that. And he was obviously looking at this other commentary because it had a, a very old um, uh, author. And when he would compare it, you know, to the text, he could easily see when the commentary was talking about something that wasn't in the text. I think it's in Revelation chapter 2, it talks about baptism and things like that, but... Um, it's it's not in the text, but it's in the commentary, things like that. So this is the same thing James White would say about Lorenzo Valla and Erasmus, that they looked at the commentaries and they, they were sort of mismatched in the Latin. Um, you know, these are the sort of, sort of things that, that could also uh, happen in the Greek. So because the book of Revelation was never particularly suited uh, to the Greeks, it is rarely found among them. And so, since we were desirous that our edition um, should be remiss with no respect, with considerable effort, we extorted out of that illustrious man, John Capino, a very ancient codex, which contained a commentary to this work. From that, we could ensure the words that belonged together were correctly transcribed. But at the end of the following words... Uh, were missing by a scribal error. Okay, so this is what he's saying in this very ancient manuscript was missing. This is still the words of Erasmus. And if anyone shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and from the holy city and from those things which are written in this book. So still Erasmus, he says, but our impression was that a scribe had made a mistake in that instance. Since, as the words in this book occur twice, his eyes passed involuntarily over the latter occurrence, thus omitting the phrases in between. And so, you know, para parablepsis, uh, homo eteuton. And indeed, book writers make no mistake. So this is still Erasmus. And indeed, book writers make no mistake um, more frequently than this, so it was quite a common error. Um, there was no doubt uh, these words had been omitted by error and that their number was small. Therefore, to avoid a gap in the text, we made good the Greek from our Latin copies. Um, but since we did not want this to escape the notice of the reader, we made mention of what we had done in the annotations so that if our words differed in any way from those which the author of this work originally set down there, the reader, once having procured a copy, would be able to restore the original. So how did, like just going back to what James White's saying here, how did Erasmus know it was Homo Eteuton if he only had one manuscript? The, the Reuchlin's. And it was missing these verses. Obviously, he had more than one manuscript. That's, that's sort of what I'm trying to prove here. I understand I'm still in the grey area of um, of Erasmus and do, do the Latin thing. But th that just totally writes off the whole concept that, of what James White's saying. And this is from Erasmus's own words. And so, um, so he must have had a Greek manuscript of Revelation 22, um, verse 19, because he's talking about it and talking about homo, homo Italia time. Okay, so I'm nearly done, probably about another 20 minutes, I think. Wettstein went on to quote uh, the other passage from Erasmus, uh, Apologia addressed to Lee, um, cited as Antwerp 1520, in which Erasmus talked about the same missing portion of the Greek text at the end of the book of Revelation. This passage detailed how when he w was absent from Basel, he had only the text of Reuchlin available to him. So that's when he was away from home. He's looking at this other manuscript, okay? 
Um, so it's a bit like, so, you know, you're, you're at home, you've got all your Bibles there, but then you go away and you find a, another Bible and you're going through that, you know. <clears throat> In which Erasmus talked about the same missing portion of the Greek text at the end of the book of Revelation. This passage detailed how when he was absent from Basel, he had only, so I'm reading, I've done Homo Teuton right there. Um, he had only the text of Reuchlin available to him. Erasmus um, was still not able to supply the missing verse in Greek because Reuchlin's text omitted several verses at the end of the book of Revelation. So he's searching around trying to find these words in the Greek. Um, he then sent a copy edited from Reuchlin's Greek text to his editorial companions in such a way that the Greek could be inserted in the proper place and telling his editors that they should supply the missing Greek from the Aldine edition. So, you know, Erasmus is heavily involved in both of these. Here, Erasmus was referring to the Greek Testament being prepared at that time by the family and friends of the printer Aldus of Venice. This Aldine text was not published until 1518, one complete year and more after Erasmus's first edition in 1516, but it had been in preparation for several years prior. So I think I read that whole um, paragraph earlier, but it seems to fit here as well. It was based in part on manuscripts differing from those used by Erasmus. In this case, Erasmus had information that the Aldine edition contained the missing verse, and indeed the 1518 Aldine edition as eventually published, um, Revelation 22.19, is identical to the words of the first edition of Erasmus. So basically, this is an error on James White. He's looking and saying, well, these words are identical, so he must have forgot to do it. No, the words are identical because he did do it. <laughs> the exact opposite. In view of the speed with which Erasmus is known to have arranged for the printing of his first edition, it is probable that the missing Greek reading was conveyed to Erasmus's co-editors in Basel by letter from Venice. We now know where Erasmus obtained his Greek text for the single verse which was missing in his other Greek copies and which was absent with a whole set of verses in the Reuchlin Codex because of the missing last page. Erasmus's co-workers procured it from the Aldine Greek Testament um, in its unpublished form. Okay. <clears throat> there were accompanying annotations in the editorial process telling the reader the Latin was temporarily expedient. This whole section was similarly misinterpreted by Wettstein and in addition to presuming Erasmus back translated from the Latin in his first edition as published, he additionally, though less importantly, saw a contradiction between the few words of the single verse missing according to the first quotation and the several verses mentioned in the second. Um, though Erasmus was talking about different episodes. The first related to the Greek codices plural, referred uh, to constantly by Erasmus, which omitted the single verse cited here. So it's talking about, you know, when it says the book of life, obviously there, there were Greek manuscripts that um, had changed that. And so he believed it was homo eteuton, talks about that. Then in the second um, edition, He's talking about this Reuchlin's thing, and it's, it's a totally different concept. And so, um, the first related to the Greek codices, plural, referred to constantly by Erasmus, which omitted the single verse here, and the second to the unique Reuchlin codex, which omitted all the last few verses. Of course, the confusion existed only in Wettstein's mind and resulted in him swallowing the original lie that Erasmus had access to more than one single manuscript. So again, <clears throat> Erasmus's own words um, 
1520, he says, at the end of the book of Revelation, in the copy on that occasion was the only one available to us, for that book is rarely found among the Greeks. More than one verse was missing. Um, those we added according to the Latin codices, and it was done in such a way that they could be restored to their rightful place following those that proceeded. When, therefore, I sent off a revised copy to Basel, I wrote to my companions that they should restore that passage from the Aldean edition, for that work was not yet in my possession. It was done precisely as I ordered. They got done. That's Erasmus' own words. Why would he say oh, it got done? When he So basically, uh, James White, Jane Cranes are saying it didn't get done. Whoops, banana peel moment. The following are quotations uh, from Tregellis in the 19th century, um, showing how he seized on Bengal speculation, like Wettstein had done in the 18th, and turned it, in this case, into the pre prevailing um, text-critical myth, uh, the very cornerstone of the 19th century assault on the text of Receptus that Erasmus back translated from the Latin. Um, be it noted that this is the same Tregellus who um, resisted Erasmus's claim that Greek manuscripts had been amended deliberately to agree with the Latin. And so this is from an account of the printed text of the Greek New Testament, 1854. So this is Tregellus. He says, for the apocalypse, he had one mutilated manuscript borrowed from Reuchlin and so James White repeats this over and over you know he went to Basel and there was no manuscript so he borrowed one from Reuchlin and that's all he used you know that's what he says in which the text and commentary were inter intermixed almost unintelligibly and so he couldn't understand it you know <laughs> probably because he couldn't understand it and thus he used here and there the Latin Vulgate for his guide, retranslating into Greek as well as he could. This was the case with regard to the last six verses, um, which from the mutilated condition of his manuscript were wholly wanting. And so um, I hope you can see the inconsistency there. So... Um, I won't go back through, you know, what James White said or whatever. But this shows us that this whole concept of him having only one manuscript is wrong. This opens up the whole can of worms to um, which manuscript he's actually talking about when he's saying, okay, there's Homo on here. We've gone, uh, we've used the Latin as a guide here, but uh, I'm sending this off to my um, my friend's um my, my editors back in Basel there to get the uh, edition of Reuchlin and there to correct these things, the, un, the unprinted edition of Reuchlin. And then later on, he's talking about how the Reuchlin was missing the last page and all this sort of stuff. And these are separate issues, completely separate issues, but they've been molded into one to make it look like the last six verses were, um, were just from the Latin Vulgate. Now, can't you see now why someone who believes that the text receptus is accurate, when you just look at what Erasmus has said, when you do a, a cursory look through his annotations, when you just look at, you, you can see that the whole concept of have, him having one manuscript is wrong. And so that's something that James White needs to look at. And he's saying that I'm unteachable, okay? But I've just... He's saying, do you even go to the annotations? Okay, I went to the annotations and looked at that, and I can see that even in the quotation, um, even in the quotation of Crans, which I'll just quickly go to, um, uh, what was it, page 64, I think it was. <clears throat> uh, 67. Um so he reads, oh, I've gone too far. Yeah. 
So basically, yeah, he repeats the same thing. Jan Cran says he tries to imagine the working um, conditions of Froben's shop and he concludes that Erasmus could not have done otherwise, otherwise with a case of revelation than fill in the gaps from the Reuchlin's manuscript, the Codex, with the help of the Vulgate. And so this is Tregellus. He had only the Latin Vulgate as his guide. And as he found the, man the manuscript, several times omitted clauses, um, which ought certainly to be received as parts of the sacred text, he might naturally conclude that other places where the Vulgate, as he had it, contain words or sentences not in his copy, that they ought to be supplied and thus unconsciously introduced additions into the Greek text. So here he is going through just making up a Greek text. So this is this is the barrow that uh, Kranz is pushing. This is this is the parrot. What uh, James White is parroting. I'm going to have a drink of water. I'm getting a little bit dry. I know this has gone a lot longer than I thought it would. Okay. Um, just trying to find some of Erasmus's own words. So Cranz has written here, Erasmus writes, Thus, when I sent the revised copy to Basel... I wrote to my friends that they should restore the place from the Aldine edition, for this work has not yet been published by me. So notice it's an unpublished Aldine edition, where James White's like, um, it's been published, you know, sort of thing. Um, yeah, sorry, no, I've made a massive error there. Um, it shouldn't say published, it should say purchased. But I think what I've done, I've actually, I've, excel, I've, I've exceeded my battery limit and my battery's down on zero at the moment and I'm starting to go back over things which don't really need to go, I don't really need to go back over. And so I'll leave it there. I'm just trying to find this one thing. Um, actually, it'll be in what I wrote. I'm trying to, been, I'm trying to read Jan Kranz's book and read this quote by Erasmus. Um, no, can't find it. I could be here all day. All right, well, I'm going to leave it there. I'd appreciate your comments. Um... Uh, if you have any other material that you can add to this. So basically, I'm, this is the first of my study that I've done. And so if I am wrong here, please show me. Um, if I have made things unclear, please show me. Um, but I hope that you have seen that I am not just accepting the TR position and defending it at all costs and whatever. I'm looking at what these guys have written and clearly they have been deceived by Tregellus um, by saying there's, there was only one manuscript of Revelation. And this opens a whole can of worms to, to look at what Erasmus said and to, to doubt what he did. And, and we can see James White clearly just saying um, you know, Erasmus is wrong. He, he says, well, they changed it. And, and he's like, they didn't change it. You know, so um, these are things that need to be looked at. These are things that need to be brought up. Um, sorry for being long-winded, but I just had to go through the James White thing. Then I had to go through my thing. And um, th I'll probably turn this into a better article, something more palatable. Um, I was doing this in my spare time yesterday and this morning. And so, um, yeah, sorry if it's been a little bit all over the shop, but uh, I hope you can understand exactly um, what I've been getting at here. So uh, God bless you guys. And... Uh, yeah, please comment, please share this with others, and um, thanks for watching. God bless.